Hello, and welcome to Baker McKenzie's Resilience, Recovery, and Renewal podcast series, dedicated to helping your organization navigate the full continuum of the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Whether you're managing the immediate crisis, stabilizing operations, or evolving your business, this podcast will cover key insights to help strengthen your organization's capacity to respond, recover, and thrive. My name is Jennifer Northam, and I've spent over 20 years as a producer and journalist covering international business issues for leading news organizations. As companies look to build resilience and recovery in the aftermath of the pandemic, the focus on environmental, social, and governance has really accelerated on a global scale. And in this episode, we'll take a closer look at the state of sustainable finance, and we'll ask the question, How is the growth of green investment products taking shape? Joining me today, we have four very experienced experts in this area. Paul Stanley's with us. Paul leads HSBC's sustainable finance work for the US from within the corporate sustainability function. And from Baker McKenzie, we have Adam Farlow. Adam is head of ESG debt and equity. Andy Sager joins us. He's head of responsible investment. And Caitlin McGarrelin. Caitlin is a partner in responsible investment. Now, ESG investing has been in the spotlight for a number of years, but interest has really skyrocketed. According to Bloomberg, more than $200 billion of green bonds have been issued this past year alone. Adam, first, can you just explain to us what green finance is for those who may be new to the topic? And why do you think we're seeing such dramatic growth in this area? Well, green finance is traditionally thought of as any sort of finance that is designed to protect the natural environment, or to manage how the environment impacts finance and investment. I take a wide view of it. I do understand those that focus green finance specifically on climate change finance, finance aimed at financing the transition to a carbon net zero world, which is the existential issue of our day. But I and many others, including green finance, other financial initiatives aimed at protecting our natural world, For instance, forest bonds or blue bonds, which are designed to finance the protection of specific areas of the undersea environment. Green finance can also include changes in our regulatory regimes and reporting systems to help investors understand and markets to properly price the environmental impact that our investments make. There's an increasing sense of urgency and expectation about putting the global economy on a path towards sustainable development. In my part of the world, uh, the urgency stems from a massive projected investment gap of over 200 billion euros each year in the EU alone to meet the Paris Climate Agreement goals. And that sense of urgency relates to the fact that sustainable finance can provide a solution to help plug this massive funding gap. And the pandemic is continuing to further push the climate agenda. We're really on the cusp of what has been described as a wholesale re-engineering of the financial markets. Now, Paul, HSBC has had a robust sustainability program for some time now, and it recently announced a new ambition to become a net zero bank, support its customers with $750 billion of sustainable financing and investment over the next 10 years, and unlock new climate solutions. Can you tell us a little bit about this and why has sustainability become such a key factor for HSBC strategy? I've been at HSBC for 10 years and sustainability has been a core part of the bank's mission for for that entire time. I think it's fair to say that banks like HSBC play a really critical role in the transition to a low carbon economy and and providing a sustainable future, um, which has some incredible risks and, and some incredible opportunities as well. So these commitments, which really fit into three buckets, build upon our existing credentials as a world leader in green social sustainability bonds. We've had a a world leading ESG research team since 2007, and we were named the world's best bank for sustainable finance in 2019 and 2020 um, by Euromoney magazine. And these commitments are really a recognition that we need to do even more and we need to accelerate our efforts. So for the first bucket, um, becoming a net zero bank, it really builds upon our existing uh, task force for climate-related financial disclosures or or TCFD disclosures, 
where we've been transparent over the past couple of years that nearly a quarter of our balance sheet is composed of higher carbon sectors, things like buildings, automotive, oil and gas, and chemicals. And while we continue to be transparent, we're going to grow in some sectors and shrink in others. We're very focused on standing by these clients across these sectors that need our support the most and are committed to transitioning. And over time, we're going to need to be as good at reassessing a business model's contribution to building a, a new and, and resilient low carbon world as we've historically been at assessing credit risk. So in the second bucket, under supporting our, our customers, we've established a dedicated ESG solutions unit that's specifically focused on supporting clients in their journey towards lower carbon emissions. We led the world's first transition sukuk for Etihad Airlines uh, to help them finance some of their plans to use more fuel efficient planes and eliminate single use plastics. We also helped a Swiss company, Lafarge Holsom, uh, who's one of the world's largest cement producers, launch a sustainability link bond just last week where if they don't achieve their carbon emissions target by 2030, uh, bond investors are gonna be entitled to a higher coupon. And then just finally, under the climate solutions bucket, probably what I'm most excited about was our announcement about a month ago where we launched HSBC Pollination Climate Asset Management, which is gonna be one of the largest uh, natural capital managers that's looking to foster connections and, and diverse uh, investment opportunities within the natural capital space and is also gonna support the growing demand for carbon offsets, which some estimates say it could be uh, as much as $1.4 trillion annually by 2050. Adam, you know, prior to this pandemic, climate change was really the main focus of ESG investing. And we've seen that shift or refocus of priorities as, as consumers and companies place a greater emphasis on the social aspect as well as good governance. When talking with your clients, what trends have you seen emerging in the space? Well, ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. Uh, and 2020 was the year that put the S in ESG. In a year when racial justice has rightly been front page news, it is gratifying, uh, but perhaps no surprise, that we've assisted clients in funding the growth in areas like their spend aimed at minority and women-owned businesses. And how companies govern themselves matters to investor returns. We've always known that, but only now are we really developing the tools necessary to measure what is good governance. Paul, HSBC has recently released a survey on sustainable financing and investing. What were some of the key takeaways and what impact is sustainable initiatives having on investors and their investment decisions? So on the investor side, nearly half of investors around the world think that taking ESG factors into account can improve returns and lower risk. The first time that we've seen that is the dominant driver for investors. And secondly, less than half of investors globally feel held back by obstacles to ESG investing. So that's down from about 61% a year ago. And the other thing that really stood out to me in the capital market space is that 36% of all bond investors who do not buy green or labeled bonds said that they expect to start buying them seriously for the first time in the foreseeable future. So taking that trend and combining it with the current investors who have told us that they plan to buy more, this suggests that investor appetite for green paper could, could at least double. Looking on the issuer side, 97% of issuers globally said that they expect to redeploy capital in response to environmental and social challenges and opportunities over the next five years. A third of those said they're gonna make substantial changes and then nearly half are gonna make noticeable changes. So while on the investor side, uh, the key driver was improved returns and lower risk, on the issuer side, it still is overwhelmingly values as the strongest driver, um, followed by NGOs and then customers. It sounds like everything's moving in the right direction. I mean, some other interesting facts that I read in the report was that nearly 30% of all investors said the pandemic had really strengthened their commitment to considering ESG factors. And in regards to issuers, 41% now believe even more strongly that becoming sustainable is important. Why do you think we're seeing such a dramatic shift on, in this space? One, I think it really is that risk and return and companies are realizing that there's value from as far as top line growth, regulatory relationships, attracting talent, invest in optimization. I mean, you don't want to have stranded you know, assets that are worth something now and stranded assets down the road and investors are keeping that in mind. 
Second, I think COVID's provided a, a stress test similar to what we're going to see with climate change. With COVID, we're going to be able to develop a, and distribute a vaccine over the next year and ideally get back to sort of normal. Uh, with climate change, once we've reached a breaking point, there's not really going to be a, a, a quick fix. So I think investors are picking up on both of those things. Related to the survey, um, the S in ESG really emerged as a big trend and a large number of respondents, including 38% of issuers and 23% of investors concluded that they had previously paid too little attention to the social aspect of, of ESG. A couple weeks ago, we actually led the first social gender bond of its kind in uh, Latin America for FIRA in partnership with, with IDB, uh, which the use of proceeds go towards supporting uh, women-owned uh, enterprises and women working in the agricultural space. And then finally, I, I would just highlight uh, our initiative Fast Infra and Sustainable Infrastructure stood out as a priority for issuers and investors within the survey, especially energy technologies like carbon capture, hydrogen, renewable power, as well as waste and water systems. And Fast Infra, which stands for Finance to Accelerate the Sustainable Transition, is um, an initiative that HSBC has put together. We recognize that about seven trillion of investments going to be required each year through 2030 to reduce the carbon footprint of infrastructure and transform existing infrastructure systems. And there's a gap of about three trillion dollars annually. And the number of and scale of bankable projects remains inadequate. There's no market standards for institutional investors to assess the sustainability of these assets. So what we're looking to do is establish a consistent and globally applicable labeling system that covers ESG and reporting standards. And then in addition to that, develop financial mechanisms that'll help mobilize private uh, investment capital and scale up su successful projects across countries. So you won't be too busy the next few years. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Adam, let's look at um, what companies um, need to do to tap the ESG debt finance market. And what are the advantages? Is it more than just reputational risk? Well, in the past, green bonds could arguably been seen as a vanity project for, uh, for corporates, particularly by the corporate treasurers, uh, with no particular pricing benefit. But over the last year, finally, deals are pricing materially tighter than they would have in the non-green bond space particularly in use of proceeds bonds. And even outside of the pure ESG-driven deals, ESG ratings are driving uh, more and more transactions. And while ESG ratings themselves haven't yet reached parity in importance with traditional credit ratings, ESG teams at all of the major investment managers are able to veto any investment. Now, Caitlin, I'd love to bring you in. You work directly with financial institutions in helping them develop their ESG policies and stay on top of these evolving regulatory reforms. What are some of the challenges you've seen when working with clients? Thank you. Uh, so my perception is that a lot of organizations, um, particularly smaller organizations, but also a lot of larger ones, whether they're commercial companies or financial institutions, they may have a sort of general ESG policy in place, but they haven't always spent a huge amount of time and resources into tracking and disclosing against granular ESG standards um, until now. It's great to hear that HSBC and other sell-side firms are willing to help us you as out with this. I actually think that regulators need to be somewhat careful that they don't make ESG compliance and disclosure so costly that it ends up forming a barrier to entry um, or something that actually mitigates against financing of SMEs. But in terms of challenges, I think where financial institutions or corporates do have an ESG policy, it's often drafted in a pretty gen generic way. And it's often also designed to tell a positive story. And what regulators are increasingly expecting firms to do um, and requiring is something that goes a little bit beyond that positive story, by which I mean a disclosure that addresses climate risk or perhaps the principal adverse impacts that your investment strategy may have um, on environmental factors. There's a lot of difficulties around the quantification of those risks. Um, we don't always have reliable historical data, but we do know that the EU headquartered firms um, as of March next year will need to disclose something to the market around climate risk as a result of the introduction of the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. 
Um, so if you do have European stakeholders like institutional investors um, or banks, then they may start expecting data from you um, around ESG risk factors in particular. Now, Andy, the European Commission has come out and said it would fund a third of its coronavirus recovery fund spending with green debt. What impact is that going to have on the market? Given that there shall be robust EU support behind environmentally and socially responsible public infrastructure, there shall be a significant impact on, on the debt capital markets. The amount of issuance at stake, approximately 225 billion euros, would, would almost double the global market while adding significant liquidity to it. Um, with plans to deploy more than half of the issuance in, in the first two years, um, there are lofty aspirations that this flood of issuance will help uh, to deliver uh, the EU's target around reducing greenhouse uh, emissions you know, by 55% by 2023. There are also lofty expectations for what this issuance will mean for the development of, of green projects and the belief that with this flood of new capital, that will contribute to uh, reduced costs for renewable energy projects. It could lead to greater demand for those projects and uh, capital leaving traditional fossil fuel projects, um, which would ultimately result in increases in supplemental issuances down the line. There are, I think, significant challenges between aspirations and and implementation. For example, we know that um, as of September, there are various reports that have said that there have been almost $40 billion worth of of greenwashing incidents. But what's striking about um, the challenges for the upcoming issuance in Europe is in some cases you could have issuance before the actual standards that govern the issuance are are implemented. Um, And so there will be challenges around what are the standards that are going to govern the issuance? Uh, What will the governance system uh, be put into place um, that will help to navigate tensions between the commission and individual you know, member states. Uh, this issuance will really catapult the EU into one of the largest uh, supranational issuers. So while I think we certainly expect to see a flood of new issuance in the market, there will be all kinds of challenges around verification and monitoring and standards for measuring the impact of of issuance to ensure that there are proper protocols in place to deter greenwashing. And Caitlin, let's kind of stay on that chat about international standards. I mean, what do you predict will become the international standard for measuring and monitoring the sustainability of investment products? There's some dialogue at the moment around sustainability reporting and uh, accounting standards like the IFRS but becoming a sort of silver bullet for resolving the quite patchy disclosures that we see across the market at the moment. Um, I think having a common accounting standard will be absolutely essential for companies, but I don't think that's quite the whole Uh, story really. You'll continue to see a lot of uh, qualitative reporting as well as quantitative reporting and I think the standards for that will vary a little bit between different jurisdictions Um, and the difficulty of course is for firms that are operating cross-border regulators may go in slightly different directions. Um, So for example you have the European Union proposing very granular standards for reporting and disclosure under the SFDR Um, with the UK choosing instead to converge towards international standards. So the UK wants to embed the TCFD into its uh, regulatory standards. You also have different regulators coming out with their own green taxonomies. Um, So the the EU's green taxonomy is now pretty well advanced, but we've had uh, a a pronouncement from the UK government um, that the UK will implement its own taxonomy post-Brexit. Um, and then Canada is also coming up with its own taxonomy. So I think that the TCSD will probably be a popular international choice amongst regulators in terms of influencing local standards. 
um, and the EU taxonomy will also inform the development of local regulations, but you will probably see a multiplicity of different standards in different local markets um, because they, they need to be tailored to those local markets. And another thing that actually will make these sorts of taxonomies and standards more challenging to the market is that there won't be a static set of criteria. Um, they'll tighten and probably become more restrictive over time as regulators push firms uh, and the corporate sector generally towards carbon neutrality. Andy, let's turn to ESG funds. How are ESG funds developing and maximizing this growth in green products? And, and can you walk us through the investor appetite right now? Today, there are more than a thousand organizations that fit under the impact investing or ESG umbrella. And we believe that they collectively manage more than, than $500 uh, billion dollars, uh, of assets under management. Um, the United Nations announced that investment managers who oversee more than 80 trillion are now covered by its its principles for responsible uh, investment, uh, which are more general guidelines than really strict criteria. But it shows that um, there is significant investor appetite um, for ESG investment products, while also being uh, also showing that there's tremendous room for growth. I think the the key issues for managers are. How do you measure ESG impact? And do you have to give up a financial return in order to have an impact? And what a lot of successful managers have found and are saying to the market at large is that these two questions are essentially uh, uh, false choices. Um, And we've seen that uh, with how some of the biggest funds have met investor demand in this space. So in the last few years, we've seen Bain Capital, TBG, KKR, uh, Apollo, um, they've all generated uh, impact funds. And they're convinced that it, that this trade-off between um, an ESG mandate and financial return, it's a false choice. Um, the New York Times reported in, in August that 64% of funds that focus on ESG beat their benchmarks this year. And that's considerably better than the performance of of traditional funds thus far in in, in 2020. Ultimately, ESG investment managers have found themselves being successful by showing the ways that uh, funds that are mission oriented, where employees believe in the mission of the company and customers are more loyal to the companies because they believe that um, by buying that company's products or using its services, they're participating in the greater good that and mission-oriented uh, architecture that's built into the corporate governance of those companies translates into superior returns. So Andy, you've, you've talked a little bit about what some of the private equity firms are, are doing in this space, but what role can they play in financing green projects? So as one of our clients likes to say, we know it's possible to do well by doing good, but many business leaders lack the understanding and, and tools to do so effectively. Uh, private equity leaders are, are natural leaders in the impact investing space because uh, fundamentally they bring management expertise uh, to the investments uh, that they make. And so private equity leaders, for example, um, are able to succeed in this space by rechartering uh, corporations around purpose and holding them accountable and ensuring that the purpose of their investments are, are also profitable. So um, it's been interesting to see that when you take the typical Baker McKenzie client, who is a large uh, corporate client uh, with interests around the world, um, clients like that have very large value chains in today's world where it's so easy to communicate um, dissatisfaction with companies, those kinds of companies are prone to huge reputational and, and operational risks. So in the PE space, they could bring professional governance and, a, and an alignment of, of compensation and mission around their investments. Now, Caitlin, I'm gonna ask you to get out your crystal ball 
And when looking at it, what sort of innovation do you predict that we're likely to see in this space in the financial sector over the next few years? UK policymakers are very well aware of London's status as a major financial centre. Um, so they're looking very carefully at innovation in this area. And there's been a lot of cross pollination of ideas with financial firms and, and how that can be taken forward via the Climate Financial Risk Forum. One sort of industry led proposal is to address the creation of a, a really credible UK green bond market at scale and try and kickstart that through um, the issuance of green gilts uh, and possibly also through regulatory capital relief for banks and insurers investing in green products. And I think at the same time as that green bond market in the UK is becoming more established, we'll probably also see the market and policymakers really concentrate on transition bonds. Um, there's a huge need to support businesses in raising finance to transition away from more carbon intensive activities and processes. And I think we'll also see the development of new types of products like uh, green asset backed securities, uh, mortgage backed securities that again will enable our banks to actually free up capital um, and reinvest that capital in green mortgages and loans and so on. Um, and then finally, we may also see mechanisms that enable public and private finance to actually come together. I think what, what, what UK policymakers are thinking about in this space isn't just actually financing transition, it's, it's data um, and actually putting together some kind of data infrastructure, how you actually not only extract ESG data, but how you deliver it in a sensible way that makes sense both to the financial firms and to underlying end investors or, or retail clients. I mean, it's been heartening and encouraging to hear this growth we've been talking about in, in green investment and the need for a more sustainable investment. To wrap up the podcast, I'd like to ask you, what are each of you seeing people do on an individual level with their own assets to reaffirm their personal commitment to sustainable investing? And Paul, if we can start with you. Sure. So um, so HSBC put out some research in Q1 that, that certainly struck a chord with me where we, we picked a selection of, of companies that had highest ESG scores or about 10% of their revenue was from uh, climate solutions. And we found that they outperform globally by about 7%. And the outperformance was even greater in Asia and Europe. It encouraged me to look into my investments in 401k and make sure I truly understood um, how the companies that I was putting my money towards uh, took care of their people, focused on governance, focused on a, a long-term a sustainable world. Um, and I heard from a lot of colleagues as well that, that read this research and did a similar assessment of their own um, investments, which was really inspiring. Andy, what about you? Sure. So uh, I think it's been interesting to see in, in the U.S. there are now um, more than 3,000 uh, B corporations. These are for-profit companies that balance profit and and purpose. We've had a number of clients um, commit to increasing revenues by a substantial amount while slashing environmental impact. That's been interesting to see and we would expect that growth to continue. And then I think with ultra high net worth um, individuals and kind of next generation investors, they are expressing more of an interest on an individual level on their own assets and affirming that, you know, their investment portfolio is consistent with their values and wanting to invest uh, sustainably. Um, and I think investment managers are being uh, more responsive to that. And that's why you continue to see um, the growth of funds that are investing in an early stage um, green projects. Right, that's all very encouraging. Caitlin, what are your thoughts? Uh, so I think as a, a retail investor like, like you or I, you don't always have the luxury really of looking at your investment portfolio and figuring out what should go where. You, you, you basically invest in a retail pension product, maybe a stocks and shares ISA, 
Uh, perhaps if you're lucky, you've got an independent financial advisor um, that helps you out with that. But I think the, the real game changer with, with some of this stuff is going to be when those independent financial advisors and pension advisors um, actually have to ask for your preferences um, in relation to ESG, which is one of the really smart rules, I think, that the European Union um, is, is proposing to bring in. They'll also have to think about the target market for products. You will actually have somebody providing you with that data in a digestible format and actually asking you, is this something that, that matters to you? Where do you want your money to go? And Adam, we're going to leave you with the last word. What are your thoughts? Great. Well, actually, I had this conversation with my uh, independent financial advisor just this last week, uh, asked him those questions, held his feet to the fire, and he was able to answer the questions to, uh, uh, to my satisfaction. I'm comfortable uh, with, uh, with where he's putting my assets for the long term as a result of those discussions. I think anybody that uh, is having those discussions with, uh, with their advisors is doing the right thing. And if your advisor can't answer those questions, find a new advisor. I'm going to be calling mine tomorrow. <laughs> it's all very encouraging. Thank you, everybody. That's all we have time for today. But um, thank you. It was really informative. For those listening, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to send any comments or questions to 3rpodcast at bakermckenzie.com. That's the number three, the letter R, podcast at bakermckenzie.com. Or contact us through the Baker McKenzie social media accounts. Use the hashtag Resilience Recovery Renewal. More information on this topic is also available on our website at bakermckenzie.com.